Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's briefing. Uh, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute is very proud to be bringing this briefing uh, to you this morning on the whole topic of how can states comply with the Clean Power Plan, state officials working together to identify options. Over the course of the last year, there has been much discussion with regard to the administration's proposed Clean Power Plan, uh, administration proposal to reduce greenhouse emissions in the uh, electricity power sector. And that has led to many, many white papers, to all kinds of analyses, to webinars, to briefings across the country, and certainly across Washington. And even this week, I saw many, many more analyses and white papers that were being released. And all of this I think has been accelerated because it is anticipated that the administration, after having received in excess of four million comments, will be issuing a revised uh, uh, final clean power plan later this summer, either in July or August. I think one of the most important things for us to recognize, and we're going to hear much more about that this morning, is that over the course also of the last year, year and a half, is that there have been three organizations that have our national in scope that have been working together, sharing information, questions, concerns, and looking for possible options, solutions that make sense for their states. And they have been all about trying to identify ways forward, how, do, how does one best address this whole issue of reducing emissions in this obviously critical, critical sector of our economy that powers our economy. And that they have been joining together in terms of looking at how their various roles and responsibilities at the state and local level can make a difference in terms of their coordination, their cooperation, their collaboration, their understanding of each other's perspectives. Those three organizations, and we're going to hear from their leaders this morning, are the National Association of Clean Air Agencies, the National Association of State <coughs> Energy Officials, and the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. They each have very, very important roles in terms of environment and energy, regulatory, research, energy assurance responsibilities at the state and local level. And therefore, the proposed rule represents another very, very interesting challenge for these very important officials upon whom we rely with regard to looking at so much implementation of federal state and local legislation and rules. And the proposed EPA uh, Clean Power Plan is particularly unique in that this is the first time that <coughs> there has been a proposed rule that is so reliant upon looking at flexibility, looking at ways <coughs> that states can put together plans that look at a whole variety of options, technologies, resources in which to do that. So we're going to hear much more about that, the perspectives that come from these different areas of responsibility by state and local officials. So to kick off our discussion this morning is Bill Becker, who is the Executive Director of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies. NACA uh, is an organization that has the responsibility for, I should say, its, its members have the responsibility working at the state and local level in terms of implementation of uh, the Clean Air Act and have for years. Bill is, uh, he founded this organization, he's been with NACA since uh, 1980, is very much the go-to person, he has won awards with regard to his work in this whole area. And the Association of Clean Air Agencies is an association of state and local air pollution control agencies in 43 states, the District of Columbia, 
116 metropolitan areas across the country, as well as four territories. And as I said, NACAS members have the primary responsibility under the Clean Air Act for implementing our country's air pollution control problems. And so you can see that this is a rather formidable task and to talk about it and this whole, both the menu of options that NACA has put forward um, and that is one more uh, resource in the toolbox for state and local officials. What is really very, very important driver behind all of this is again, the shared perspectives and really looking at how these uh, policies and potential options really af affect and need to draw from the expertise and the shared and differing responsibilities of state and local officials. Bill. Good morning. So thank you, Carol, for that nice introduction and this very kind invitation to be here today. Uh, when I speak before a group like this, I can't help but think about my brother. My brother is a very famous scientist. In fact, he is so famous, he has a chauffeur who takes him to all of his speaking engagements. And my brother was asked to speak before a group, not unlike this, uh, to talk about climate change. And he had given this speech many, many times. And he says to his chauffeur, Joe, he says, Joe, you've heard this speech a hundred times. Why don't you give it? This group doesn't know what I look like. I'll sit in the back of the room and read a newspaper, and no one will be wiser. And Joe said, this is great. My brother said, Joe, however, under no circumstances should you ask for questions, because if you do, they're going to find out you're a fraud. And Joe was really excited about this. My brother gave him the 10 pages of speech. Joe put it aside. He gave a wonderful speech, got a standing ovation, and was feeling so cocky that he did the unforgivable. He asked for questions. Well, wouldn't you know, someone in the first row um, asked the most complicated question one could imagine. And Joe looked him in the eye and he said, Mister, that was really a stupid question. That question was so simple-minded that I'm going to have my chauffeur who's sitting in the back of the room answer it. <laughs> So, so if there's anyone here, including in the front row, that asks a question, I need help, and I have my team with me. Okay, so, um, so as Carol said, we are an association of state and local air pollution control agencies. Um, here's what I will cover today. Here's, here's what I've been asked to cover. Um, I will make a few general observations, give you some context about President Obama's clean power plan, talk to you about some of the implementation issues that state and local agencies are experiencing, and then talk about some of the implementation tools that we have published recently and will be publishing soon after the rule is promulgated, and then close with some observations after discussing our relationship with uh, the two uh, associations that Carol mentioned. So we are an association of state and local air pollution control agencies. Our office is on the other side of the Capitol. Uh, we've been there since 1980. Uh, we have 41 states. Uh, we have 116 of 117 local air pollution control agencies, Washington, D.C., and the territories. Uh, two important points about state and local air pollution control agencies. One is on page one of the Clean Air Act. Um, it gives state and local air agencies the, quote, primary responsibility of implementing our nation's laws. So our mission is to clean up the air and to implement the Federal Clean Air Act at the state and local level. And the second part of this, related, is under EPA's Clean Power Plan, which I will get into in a little while, um, we are the ones that will be developing the plans, submitting the plans, and responsible for implementing the plan. So the responsibility falls on us, even though we'll be working very closely with utility commissioners, energy officials, and many, many other stakeholders. So a couple general observations just to um, uh, move things along. First, uh, you know, I represent almost every state and local air pollution control agency in the country. 
uh, I'm not stupid. We understand the politics that um, is, is going on in the states and in communities. And there are, there are governors who aren't as enamored with this program as others. Uh, there are members of Congress who are actively fighting this. Uh, but perhaps one of the most important things I want you to understand from our perspective is uh, until or unless um, this program is curtailed in any manner, um, this is the law. And our folks are going to be implementing this program as effectively as we can and as expeditiously as we can unless we're told to stand down. And for the time being, almost without exception, we're not being told to stand down. Uh, a few other things, uh, with regard to some of the rhetoric and with regard to some of the threats of litigation, this is a proposal. This is not a final rule. And while much of the criticism against this program is focused on some very legitimate issues, it's a proposal and we expect that some of those concerns will be ameliorated when the rule is finalized. Um, second, I will predict with certainty that there will be some hiccups, there will be some bumps at the outset of implementation of this program. This is not new. No one should be worried about this. This is something that goes along with the territory, especially in implementing the Clean Air Act. We've seen this with vehicle emissions testing programs, with reform reformulated gasoline and many other programs. And we'll expect it here. And I know we're not going to panic, and stakeholders shouldn't as well. We'll work together, and we'll work through these issues. And finally, uh, with the last observation, uh, many of you are from congressional offices, and um, you can help immensely in making this program work, should your bosses want it to work. And there are authorizing provisions in the Clean Air Act under Section 105 that provides funding grants to state and local agencies to implement clean air programs. This is a very important one. The president recommended uh, a significant increase in grants to states, and Congress will be marking up the EPA budget bill next week, and we hope that you um, take a close look at that. Okay, so um, EPA's clean power plan is, is being derived from the existing Clean Air Act. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, if, if proponents of reducing greenhouse gases had their way, uh, they would prefer federal legislation. I think even the regulated community would prefer federal legislation. But we are not going to see federal le legislation in this Congress, and I don't know about the next Congress, and this is exactly why EPA has decided to use existing authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse mm -hmm. gases. And there are two provisions that are really important for you to understand. There's a provision under Section 111B that uh, requires EPA to regulate new and modified and reconstruction power plants, and rules have been proposed. And there's a provision under Section 111D that addresses the regulation of existing power plants. And it's that section under 111D that we're talking about today. But importantly, unless EPA is successful, uh, in, in issuing rules for Section 111B, 111D can't move forward. So these things are intertwined and, and um, one depends upon the other. EPA's Clean Power Plan uh, requires from electric generating units, power se the power sector, you know, very significant reductions, a 30% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. And so you look at that and you think, that's 15 years or so for utilities to comply. It's a pretty significant lead time to comply. But another part of this is that um, EPA has set an interim goal that requires a chunk, a large chunk of these emissions reductions to take place not in 2030, but 10 years earlier in 2020. And so this has been referred to as the cliff because uh, many are concerned that, that utilities and states will have a difficult time meeting this interim deadline of 2020, 10 years before the final deadline. And this has been really the core of a lot of the criticism of this proposal. And that's why I said at the outset that we shouldn't panic over a proposal. We should be thoughtful about what happens after finalization. And I am pretty sure that this cliff, this interim 
deadline will be changed when EPA finalizes its rule. Um, another very important part of this is that each state gets an emissions target goal under the Clean Power Plan. So every state's goal is going to be different, and it's going to be a rate-based goal which can be translated into a mass-based uh, equation. When EPA developed the goal for each state, it looked at four uh, relatively general building blocks, and they refer to them as building block one, two, three, and four. And I've listed them, and the first one is what can be done within the facility to improve efficiencies. The second one is how can we shift to cleaner generating sources. The third is how can we build low emitting energy sources. And finally, um, how can we pursue demand side energy efficiency. You know, there's a common denominator of this and it's doing things better and more efficiently. One of the most important things I will leave you with today is notwithstanding how EPA has set the state's targets, the states are fully uh, flexible and able to decide on their own which strategy, whether it's in any of the four building blocks or not, it can include in its plan. So the states are not bound by picking strategies just within these four building blocks. They can pick anything they think is appropriate so long as it passes muster with EPA. And that's a very important point. Here are the timelines for submitting plans. Um, this rule will be finalized probably in August. States will have a little over a year to develop their plan that they have to submit to EPA and then EPA has to review it and either approve it or reject it or negotiate. If a state is having trouble, and many will find this challenging, states will be given an additional year to submit their plan. And if a state decides, and a lot of states are thinking of this, to engage with other states in more of a multi-state program, the state will have an additional year. So the submittal of plans by state and local regulatory agencies will take from one to three years, beginning from this August. Now, um, I'd love to tell you that states are you know, almost there in developing a plan, but that's a bit ludicrous because we haven't even seen the final rule. But I will tell you, um, it's been almost an unprecedented effort in terms of the level of effort and the energy expended in the year and a half preceding this rule where our members have been meeting with almost every possible constituency in their states and with their state utility counterpart and their state energy counterpart in trying to understand the consequences and the impacts of this rule. And that's really important because this is unlike any rule we've ever implemented. Um, this is not your typical EPA rule that state and local agencies adopt. Um, we are looking at uh, activities and processes and stakeholders that, are, that have never really been affected or engaged much in implementation under the Clean Air Act. There are two basic questions that states are going to be asking and, and addressing. And this gets to the meat of the presentation. One is, what strategies, not only included in the four building blocks, but beyond the four building blocks, should states consider in meeting their target, in meeting their compliance plan obligations? And I'll be talking in a second about the menu of options that identifies anything we could possibly think of. The second equally important strategy is once you've identified a strategy, an option, a technology, that strategy has to be incorporated into a plan. It has to address enforceability. It has to address verification. It has to ensure that we're going to achieve the emissions reductions. It has to meet each of the 11 criteria that EPA has set out in its rule to uh, let states know what is acceptable to the agency. If we don't demonstrate to EPA's satisfaction that our plan passes muster, they will reject it and then there are consequences to it. So uh, the first question, what's involved is our menu of options. We published this two weeks ago. I think we had handouts uh, for the table of contents um, outside. And what it does is it identifies 
Uh, it has 25 chapters, it's 465 pages, and it identifies literally everything we and our contractor could think of that could possibly go into a state plan, whether it's part of the building blocks or not. And for each strategy, we have described it. We have identified the potential greenhouse gas reductions. We've identified um, the costs, the cost effectiveness, where that strategy has been employed. And, and equally important, we identified not just the greenhouse gas reductions, but we tried to identify the collateral non-greenhouse gas air quality benefits that could accrue. You know, if your congressman or governor or senator or stakeholder does not agree that this program is going to reduce greenhouse gases the way you want, there's still reason to consider this program seriously because you will get huge reductions mm -hmm. in smog forming emissions, in fine particulates which are killing people, and in other air pollutants which are causing a lot of significant health problems throughout the country. So there is a lot more than just greenhouse gases that could come from this program. This is what it looks like. And um, as I mentioned, we are looking at options. I won't get into them too much now. We can wait for the Q&A period. But we have chapters that address not only those strategies within the building blocks, but also chapters that we have included strategies that are outside of the building blocks. So things that EPA has not really focused on in their building blocks, but we have are, for example, improving the quality of, of the fuel you're using, of the coal you're using. A lot of the coal is high sulfur fuel and has a lot of ash, and it's not as efficient as, as other fuels. Uh, we could be switching fuels at existing sites, and um, there's a lot of uh, electricity lost and uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions lost in transmission lines and going from the power plant to the ac actual um, residential uh, community. The second question that we addressed, I'm shifting from the menu now to something else that's really important, is a model that we are coming out with about 30 days after the rule is finalized. And this model, it's kind of a misnomer, it's actually a menu of models. It's a, it's a series of regulatory pathways so that once a state has adopted a strategy, we then have to take that strategy and put it into our plan, and we will be taking for each major strategy and for each potential scenario that a state chooses, that strategy, adopting regulatory language for it, having preamble language that describes it, and we will be providing this for literally every state and local agency in the country and stakeholders so that states won't have to start from scratch in developing regulatory language that appeases EPA. Rather, they'll have it at their disposal. And this is not really um, a one-size-fits-all model because we know in the states there are, as Administrator McCarthy likes to say, there are 50 different state plans that will come in, all requiring something different. But we are trying to identify the types of strategies that we think states will adopt and then provide them um, within a month after this rule is promulgated enough specificity that they can really implement this quickly because we want to meet the deadlines. And um, our goal is to um, do this um, quickly enough that we've also taken advantage of the changes that EPA has made from proposal to final rules so that it's a timely uh, and beneficial uh, product. So let me, let me wind down and, and, and just conclude with one other very important point. Uh, I'm proud to be up here with, um, with Chuck and David from Nehru and Nazio because um, these are organizations that um, we work very closely with. We hadn't uh, worked years ago together, but it's only been recent years and recent activities under the Clean Air Act that has necessitated our groups coming together. And we have worked you know, really well on trying to figure out collectively, it's part of good government, I think, um, to understand the needs of these groups. NARUC will tell you that they're interested in reliability, and we get it, and there will be nothing in our plans that will adversely affect reliability. And David will tell you, representing the state energy officials, that their concerns is providing opportunities for 
energy efficiency, and we think that is a very important uh, strategy um, to consider, and we are all over that issue because we think it's, a, it's smart public policy. So let me conclude with a, a few observations. Um, I don't want to leave the impression that implementation of the Clean Power Plan is a slam dunk. It's not. It's going to be challenging. Uh, we understand this. But we are going to be working very, very hard at the state and local level to try to make it work. And we think the two documents, the two tools I described, um, will help accelerate um, effective implementation of that. Uh, we've already been uh, working really hard, um, laying the groundwork for compliance. We've been meeting, our members have been meeting with stakeholders. Um, they've been meeting with um, intra, intrastate, uh, all the governmental entities, so they can understand fully what's expected. Uh, and those discussions have been very, very worthwhile. Even within states who are suing EPA over this rule, there have been very good discussions. Uh, I should say a word to, about EPA's involvement. Um, they've been really, really great listeners. They've met with the states almost anywhere, anytime. They've sought our input, and we are hopeful that they're going to carry out that um, leadership and incorporate um, many of the concerns and the legitimate issues that states around the country have been offering, and we're confident that they will. And then finally, I need to say a word about um, an effort that has been being promoted, um, not just by the Senate Majority Leader, but by others, uh, for states to stand down. There's been this effort to try to persuade states to stand down and to ignore the implementation of this program. And while, you know, I said earlier, not every state likes this program, if the law's not changed, this is the law. And the consequence of standing down and not implementing this program is severe. A federal plan will be imposed, and by definition, it will be less flexible and more costly for stakeholders. Um, secondly, um, it will lead to, um, it will just show a total disregard for the tens of thousands of hours that state governmental officials have been used to meeting with uh, stakeholders and others um, in trying to make this work. And it just sends the wrong signal in light of the fact that we think greenhouse gases and climate change are real problems and must be addressed. So with that, I thank you for this invitation and I thank you for your attention. Thanks very, very much, Bill. Um, and now we will turn to another of these important energy-based organizations, uh, to David Terry, who is Executive Director for the National Association of State Energy Officials. David brings over 27 years of experience working on energy for a variety of entities, everything from being a researcher for the Washington Post to being an analyst with the National Academy of Sciences, working with the governor's uh, wind energy coalition, but he worked for NASIO beginning clear back in 2004 and worked with NASIO from, from 1996 through 2004 and then became NASIO's executive director in 2008. What is important, I think, to particularly understand about the National Association of State Energy uh, Officials is that this embraces 56 state and territory energy offices. NASIO communicates state policy views on virtually all national energy issues, which cover everything from natural gas and electricity to buildings, energy efficiency, renewable energy, industrial energy efficiency, energy emergency response and assurance and reliability, as well as energy technology innovation. And of course, all of this is, is almost always tied to also being very concerned about how this affects states' economic development. David? Thank you, Carol. I uh, appreciate uh, the introduction, and I have to thank EESI, uh, Carol's organization, uh, for hosting today's briefing and always for their excellent work. I am somewhat biased as a board member of EESI, but uh, I think you all know uh, their excellent work well, so thank you very much. 
uh, find my here. Carol covered, uh, I think, a little bit about the state energy offices. I won't belabor that. I would point out, though, uh, for those of you not familiar, uh, the energy offices are typically appointed by their governors. They focus on policy as distinct from regulation. Uh, so uh, where the utility commissioners are certainly focused on regulation of uh, economic regulation of the uh, electric utilities, the energy offices are more focused on policy, advising their legislator, advising their governors across a range of energy issues, much as Carol described. We also have a number of private sector affiliate members as, that are a part of our organization. They're non-voting members, uh, but they provide good market input and uh, a good ground check. Uh, we always are concerned with economic development impacts associated with energy, uh, so that's a, a helpful part of our organization and I think uh, a good way of understanding where we come from. Uh, with regard to the Clean Power Plan, a few things I think about our approach uh, that uh, differ from the other uh, organizations, NACA and NARUC in some ways. Uh, NASIO does not have a position on 111D or the Clean Power Plan. Uh, there's obviously a great diversity of views among the states, among the governors, as you all know and as Bill pointed out. Uh, but we do want to ensure that states have uh, options, flexibility uh, in, in the plan uh, should it move forward. We want to make sure that reliability, affordability, sustainability are protected as a part of that plan. I think we all share those goals. Uh, and the other piece of this that's important, you'll see as a theme in my comments uh, going forward, we see efficiency certainly as a great compliance option, both demand side and supply side, so transmission distribution uh, system efficiency as well as end use energy efficiency. But also, we frequently think of energy efficiency in the context of investor owned utility ratepayer programs, typically overseen by the commissions. That's a huge, important part of the compliance uh, solution set that we see. Uh, but the other part are all the non uh, so called non ratepayer programs. So if you think about the amount of money spent on energy efficiency each year in the United States, it's on the order of $50 billion. That includes private sector investment, consumers, uh, uh, utility investments, a whole range of things. And, and the bulk of that investment is happening outside of those ratepayer programs. And we want to make sure that states have the opportunity to capture those benefits, uh, take credit for them, uh, and also that we get the most cost-effective option uh, moving forward. A few examples of those I'll go into a, in a moment, but uh, certainly the ratepayer programs, but also energy savings performance contracting in the public building sector, uh, building energy codes, uh, commercial pace, industrial efficiency investments, and a range of other activities. Some of the key takeaways uh, that I would, I would keep in mind as you consider the Clean Power Plan and how it moves forward. The electricity system, uh, as many of you know, is already undergoing dramatic change. Uh, certainly a shift in natural gas uh, generation was underway. We have uh, dramatic improvements in energy efficiency in many sectors, uh, ranging from uh, those kinds of things that we all know about, LEDs and so forth uh, for lighting, but also emerging building technologies. I, we just did a congressional briefing yesterday on zero net energy buildings, and you'd be amazed to know although there are a small number, the number of buildings that are emerging that produce as much energy as they use. Um, a school just down the road in Arlington, Virginia uh, just opened uh, that does that. The first three elementary schools in the country built in Kentucky several years ago do that. So there are those issues. Certainly the integration of the internet and controls around how we use energy in the electric system um, is also uh, come to bear. So utilities already have a great deal to deal with and certainly the commissions and the state energy offices uh, and how they uh, work with them and yet at the same time Time, I think we all expect reliable, affordable, uh, environmentally uh, uh, sensible uh, uh, power to be delivered. So it's quite a challenge that was going along. And that's, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, in how complex it is to deal with all of these issues. Uh, the other uh, takeaway, and I mentioned it just a moment ago, but it's thinking about true least cost approach. And by that, I, I don't mean anything very inflammatory, but rather just a reminder that we have a wide range of options. I think that's really embodied in uh, NACA's uh, menu approach, uh, which is a, a great document. It certainly includes many of the ideas that NASIO has, and, um, and I would really encourage you to take a look at that and consider it as you, as you look at the Clean Power Plan and what the states are doing. Um, also, ensuring that 
and uh, evaluation, measurement, and verification around efficiency programs are streamlined. Uh, it's a balancing act. We have probably a habit in the, in the energy community of, uh, of, of measuring uh, to a great degree of accuracy. And while that's important, uh, this is serious business, keeping air quality, uh, meeting air requirements is serious business. We also don't want to make it so difficult uh, that it's virtually impossible for states to move forward. So finding that balance is a very tricky detail. Um, and the focus of a lot of our work and a number of other organizations, at least in, in this particular space. Certainly assisting states with ongoing no regrets uh, uh, programs and activities, and I'm going to spend a little time on that in a moment, um, and continuing the kind of dialogue we've had not only among uh, the so-called 3N groups, NASIO, NARUC, NACA, but also our members uh, on the ground, and I think that's a, a healthy and very positive uh, thing going on, not only in this area, but in other areas of, uh, of energy regulation and environmental regulation. A few things about our ongoing activities. We've, as Bill mentioned, we've been involved with uh, working with both of their organizations for some time. Uh, we've had a number of uh, meetings. They're noted here. Uh, some agreement on principles in 2014 that we submitted to EPA uh, that I would encourage you to take a look at, but places where we found common agreement around energy efficiency as compliance, as a compliance measure, certainly around reliability, um, uh, and a number of other issues. And, and I think those are, are worth noting. We've also been working on, uh, at NASIO, on compliance case studies. So looking at various energy efficiency areas, again, typically beyond uh, the ratepayer efficiency program. So working with the energy services industry, companies like Johnson Controls and Amoresco uh, and the state energy offices about how they implement energy efficiency in public buildings. So by way of comparison, uh, there's uh, about a $7 billion a year market in investment in energy efficiency in public buildings. That's almost all privately financed. Uh, so it's an amazing opportunity. We need to capture that. There's additional funds going in at the federal level and many other examples. Uh, and certainly planning sessions that we have coming up at our meetings. As I mentioned, we're working very closely with the energy offices on no regrets options and also with the private sector um, associated with the Clean Power Plan, but broadly to help meet uh, state energy and air goals. Uh, I think one in particular uh, worth noting, we have a multi-state tracking project going on in the public building investment area, uh, trying to uh, see where we can streamline uh, activities in that space, both in terms of measuring the emissions that are saved associated with projects, the amount of investment return, the amount of benefit to the taxpayer and energy savings and so forth. We also have a similar project uh, with the state of Texas uh, and a number of other organizations looking at building energy code compliance. So existing codes that are on the books, what kind of energy savings are they producing and how are we verifying that and what kind of emissions reductions come from that. So these are capturing in existing uh, programs that uh, are cost effective in many cases on their, own, uh, on their own merit and we're not capturing the emissions benefits in the way we can and we want to make sure we do that. Similarly, in the industrial space, uh, there are great opportunities there, uh, largely uh, uh, private sector voluntary activities in this space. We see that over and over again. There are a number of state energy offices that operate assistance and financing programs for their small and large industrial, industrial uh, uh, um, partners and stakeholders on the ground. The amount of savings that can be generated there is enormous. It is generally, unless it's inside of a utility program, is generally not captured from an emissions perspective at the state level. So again, another opportunity. And I think you kind of get the, get the, the flavor here. It's just a, a little chart that gives you a sense of the level of uh, private investment just in the public building sector at the state and local level. So right now we're at about uh, $6 billion a year. That's escalating over time. It's estimated to be nearly $20 billion a few years down the road. Uh, and again, these are largely private sector investments. The savings from the project pay for the project over time. Uh, the emissions associated with it um, are well documented, uh, generally verified by contract. Um, it's really an extraordinary process. It's a great example and one of the areas that we focused uh, in particular at NASIO. There's a, the text just came up, I guess. A number of ongoing activities, in addition to our coordination with uh, NARUC and NACA, uh, I mentioned we are working on compliance studies in about uh, seven or eight areas. Uh, they're not all listed here, but they include use of combined heat and power by the private sector, whether that's at a hospital or a university or an industrial plant, um, as a much more efficient way to provide power in some cases, again, capturing the emissions from that. So we're developing case studies for, state, for states to consider about how that works at the state level. And 
and how they could capture those savings, how they might EM and V it, and also draft plan language. So uh, that may be something a state can consider plugging into their plan. And we're certainly coordinating closely with Bill's group on that. Uh, they are the experts on the plan element, uh, but we're trying to provide as much as we can packaged options states can use should the plan move forward. We're also doing that in other areas. I mentioned building energy codes, but also uh, retrofit of residential uh, uh, properties, uh, uh, existing federal programs. Uh, there's a, a well-known program in the residential sector, Energy Star, New Homes. Uh, those savings are very well documented and put out by EPA. Uh, they are generally not captured at the state level for, for compliance uh, uh, purposes under environmental rules. And so we think there's an option there. Clearly, EPA is satisfied with uh, that program and the way that they operate. The states find it a very advantageous program as well, as do the private sector builders. Uh, so all of these activities are really leading up to that uh, initial takeaway that I mentioned, which are to really capture the least cost approaches, the true least cost approaches. If I were uh, in an energy office trying to advise my governor, work with my uh, partner agencies at the state level, we want to find a way to get to the least cost approach to compliance. So picking up on these private investments, the voluntary programs, existing state policies are just sort of logical places to begin. The trick, of course, is how we quantify that, doing it in, a, in, a, uh, in an economic and, and reasonably simple format, and also making sure we do have verifiable savings. They, clearly, the uh, meeting compliance uh, requires that uh, as it should. Just some next steps on where we're headed. Uh, we will complete the uh, efficiency uh, pathways or case studies that I mentioned over the course of the next couple of months. We'll be submitting those to the Environmental Protection Agency um, after our states have had an opportunity to comment on them. We've been working closely with them. Uh, those will be uh, submitted as options for EPA to consider. They'll certainly be shared with all of our state members, with NACA and NARUC as options as they consider state-level discussions with their members. Uh, we also are working in another important area that uh, has a benefit for uh, potential clean power plan compliance, but it has a benefit that's broader in the area of energy and air coordination, and that's a national energy efficiency registry. So one of the challenges, as many of these private sector and voluntary programs are implemented around energy efficiency, is who owns the efficiency credit? Who owns the associated emissions reduction? Uh, is it verifiable? Is it transparent? So a registry, a voluntary registry, gives the opportunity for companies, for states, for local governments to enter those projects, uh, meet certain criteria, uh, and have a means of verifying that. So it may promote uh, the ability of a state to count whether they're getting toward a particular energy goals, certainly toward the, uh, the clean power plan. There's a, an obvious linkage there. Uh, but generally, I think it's helpful with state activities, and that's an important uh, one to watch. I think it's a, a, valuable, a valuable approach. We are working with about seven states on the compliance, uh, or excuse me, on the uh, governance rules uh, around that. Uh, private sector organization, the climate registry is working on some of the substance and would actually operate such a registry if it moves forward. And lastly, and, and, and certainly most importantly, working directly with uh, not only our energy offices, but with the EPA regional offices and presumably the Department of Energy as we, as we move forward, if the plan moves forward. Starting in September, we have a number of regional meetings planned uh, with the regional uh, EPA offices and our members, and certainly support uh, in-state uh, work across our three organizations' uh, representative members. Just some contacts uh, at NASIO at the end here for a takeaway. Um, I do want to reiterate what Bill said. I think the cooperation among uh, Nehru, NACA, NASIO, uh, certainly among our members, but particularly Bill and Chuck, uh, has been exceptional, um, not only on this area, but over the years uh, as uh, we try to uh, act in the best interest of the states and, uh, and find least cost approaches to uh, meet really what are um, uh, interlinked uh, goals and challenges. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now we will turn to the third leg of this stool, uh, Charles Gray, who is the Executive Director of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or as we all say, NARUC. And Chuck has been, uh, while well, he was named Executive Director in 1999, he has been involved with NARUC since 1979, serving in various capacities. And one of the things that I think is also important with regard to 
looking at this key role of state commissions across the country are the wide variety of issues that they must deal with uh, on a regulatory basis that ranges from, yes, energy, but it's electricity, it's gas, they also, in terms of many states, in terms of water, telecommunications, and transportation. So it varies across the country, but, but covers uh, a number of sectors. And so this, again, uh, obviously requires a lot of skill, a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot of wisdom in terms of being able to work across all of these sectors and then a, and across all of these states uh, with different concerns, priorities, resources in each of these states. And so we are very glad to welcome Chuck Gray. I have one slide and that's it. Um, <laughs> so hopefully this will go quickly. Uh, uh, thanks, Carol, for the very kind introduction and for inviting me here today um, to follow up on these very glib speakers here. So this will be a little disappointing. But um, <laughs> I, I start with the standard disclaimer that the remarks are, you're about to hear are my words only and should not be attributed to any NARUC members, especially since we're on C-SPAN. They're probably watching. So I need to... <laughs> To, to get that out there. I also have a second disclaimer, which is similar to what David said, concerning the merits of the EPA proposal one, under 111D. I want to make clear that NARUC has taken no position for or against whether the, the, the EPA should be moving forward with this. Um, however, we have members commissions who are very strongly opposing the, the proposal as well as very strongly supporting that. And I think you'll see that uh, continue to, as, the, as we get nearer the final rule. Um, thanks for describing NARUC. NARUC is a national organization, I'll just repeat, 50 state commissions plus the District of Columbia, and they always make sure that we acknowledge that the District of Columbia is not a state and it has a public service commission. Um, and importantly, our members regulate retail electric utility services, which is at the heart of this discussion, um, including generation services provided to retail customers that are the focus of the Clean Power Plan. They also regulate uh, natural gas uh, uh, distribution and uh, purchases by uh, retail customers as well, which are clearly implicated by, uh, by the Clean Power Plan as it now stands in, 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 uh, in the, at the EPA proposal. Um, <clears throat> important, what that means really is uh, many of the options that Bill has described or that are in the, the menu uh, fall squarely within the regulatory jurisdiction of one or more state commissions and in many in other cases in, in the jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the areas of transmission and wholesale market compliance options. Um, just as an example, um, in I think it's Chapter 3 of Bill's um, menu, there's a, a, a section on combined heat and power. Uh, and combined heat and power is a long-standing issue before the State Public Utility Commissions dating back to actually before I started working at NARUC in 1978 when Congress passed PURPA, that it was called cogeneration at that time. Now it's called combined <coughs> heat and power. but. That uh, empowers the public utility commissions. Essentially, two big issues: um, interconnection of the of the of the plant to the the grid, and then buyback prices that the utility uh, would pay to the or the to the um, owner of the CHP uh, facility. Uh, those things will have those decisions as as a compliance option will have to be vetted by the state utility commission as it as it's added to the to the state plan. Another example is um, uh, on retiring aging power plants. Those power plants have been certificated by public utility commissions if they're in retail rates. And um, if, they're, uh, if, there's, if they're closed before their useful life, life is over, there may be stranded cost recovery issues that the state commissions will have to address if the plant hasn't been fully depreciated. Also, just the decision itself to, re to shut down the plant may be required to be approved by the Public Service Commission. I guess um, my point is, uh, while the need for 3N coordination here in Washington has been important and I think very, very necessary, um, close coordination between the commissions, the air regulators, and the energy offices out in the states is crucial and it's indispensable, really. There needs to be this dialogue going forward. Um, 
as just talking about the relationship, our, uh, the coordination between the three associations has been continuous and be beneficial over the last three or so years. And I think, from speaking from NARUC's perspective, that's been a, a very rewarding relationship throughout. Um, as David mentioned, we've most of our work in the last year and a half has been on energy efficiency, both utilities and third-party uh, energy efficiency program. But I think now with the final rule, it's gone to OMB and it's going to be coming out soon. I think we'll have to broaden our, our relationship now and look at other issues as well as the as the energy efficiency uh, questions that we've that we've worked on before. Um, I know from from NARUC's perspective, we will be eager to participate in a broadened discussion with, with the three ends um, uh, as we go forward. Uh, when the rule is out, what role will NARU members play in efforts to develop state compliance plans? Well, I think uh, David mentioned it quite accurately. Uh, our watchwords of our members are going to be focused on two issues, reliability and affordability. Um, as economic regulators of electric services, uh, uh, the state commissions and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission are responsible for ensuring that wholesale and retail services meet these two goals, affordability and reliability. Our members who have been working closely with FERC on reliability issues uh, over the last uh, few months, uh, resulting in the letter that FERC sent to the EPA on May 15th, suggesting that EPA consider adopting a reliability safety valve. Uh, we have not taken a position as an organization on that proposal, but uh, uh, there's strong support among our members that uh, that FERC's suggestion to EPA be accepted and, and that there be a, 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 some kind of a contingency in case the, the, the compliance plans do raise uh, re reliability issues. Um, in addition to the work that uh, NAC is doing on the compliance plan, and this is where my slide comes in, um, NARUC has been developing uh, white papers and reports in response to what appears to be a growing interest in, assess in assessing what a regional compliance plan looks like or a multi-state compliance plan would look like. Um, as reported in actually just this week in, in Inside Climate News, 41 states are now in regional groups exploring this uh, multi-state option, including states that strongly oppose the, the, the CPP. I think Bill's suggestion that even if you don't like it, you, you should do it rather than have the feds do it is, is, is really working in a, lot of state, in a lot of states that are not wild about the, the proposal. For our, for our part, um, we released a, a report last month uh, on behalf of the Eastern Interconnection State Planning Council. Some of you may know what that is. Um, we call it ice pick. Uh, and it's, um, the report was issued about a process for how you would get states together to think about putting together a, a regional plan. Uh, the white paper that the link is right there, um, was funded by the Department of Energy through some of our uh, grant, grant uh, uh, assistance. And it's really based on two premises. First, um, that except for Texas, the grid is interstate, the markets are interstate, but compliance plans under Section 111D, at least on its face, are state-specific. So there needs to be a connection there. And I think the second premise that uh, drives this discussion is that uh, multi-state, there's been a lot of studies recently that multi-state compliant, uh, compliance plans reduce compliance costs, improve operational efficiency, and, and strengthen reliability. So I think there's a lot of growing interest in, in trying to see how, how far this goes. I think the, one of the questions is, will the states have enough time to put something together that requires a lot of work? Um, um, the, our, the white paper that we've issued provides steps and a process for states to get together to initiate a multi-state approach. It, it contains a sample MOU that states can look at and if they want to uh, agree to uh, as they come together, the MOU is there for their benefit. Um, while our paper focuses mostly on process issues, there are some uh, proposals and many proposals out, out, out in the firmament, if you will, on what a compliance plan like this might look like. Um, the, probably the best known regional uh, compliance plan is REGI, 
the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is, uh, operates primarily in New England and the, and the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, there was a story today in E&E &E that now Pennsylvania and Virginia are thinking about joining Reggie as well. So I think we're, we're uh, likely to see that as at least a model. It's a cap-and-trade based system, uh, which may be uh, States may seek to join the existing REGI or set up a similar kind of uh, project in, in other states. Our friends at the regional transmission organization, the RTOs that run the, run the grids and the organized uh, power markets, have also uh, proposed some uh, a regional compliance plan that they would help implement through, the, through their control over the wholesale power markets. Not quite clear to me how it's actually going to work, but they're, they're working on it. And then just recently, the, the Georgetown Climate Center released a paper outlining a system of single state compliance approaches with interstate elements, a sort of a hybrid between a, a single state plan and a, and a regional plan. And that's going forward as well. Um, many of the, the, the interstate elements are likely to be the compliance options that, that the NACA menu uh, recommends. Um, well, NARUC believes it is not our role to tell the states that they should do a regional plan. Um, it is clearly an option that, if chosen, will require the close coordination among air regulators, energy offices, and utility commissions like we haven't seen before, not only as we, as we look at multiple jurisdictional authority. I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, and I might mention, too, that um, we hope in the f fall, in September, or uh, hopefully, to once again work with uh, our colleagues here to put together another forum that really looks at uh, the next steps forward uh, and looking at model plans and what this might represent uh, once the EPA uh, rule for the Clean Power Plan is, is um, finally released. So let's open it up for your questions and I would just ask you to go to the microphone here in the aisle and please identify yourself with your question. Do we have any? Okay, back here. Could you just please? Yeah. William Yateman, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Just a quick question. Mr. Becker, you seem to assert um, categorical jurisdiction over implementation of the Clean Power Plan for the air quality regulators. And uh, that seemingly that was conflicted by what Mr. Gray said. And I was just wondering, is that a decision for state legislatures or has that already been decided in your mind? So I think we're saying the same thing, but I'll let Chuck speak for himself. Uh, under the Clean Air Act and under Section 111D, uh, state air regulators have the legal responsibility of developing a plan and implementing the plan. Um, we, of course, will be working with uh, state utility regulators and state energy officials in pursuing the kinds of programs that they both outlined. And it may be that the state will have to take actions with utility commissioners concerns and energy officials concerns in mind as part of the plan. But the ultimate responsibility lies with the state environmental agency and until we're told differently, that's our responsibility. Yeah, I don't disagree. I, clearly, the, the the law is the law in the states, and as Bill says, the air regulators are responsible for uh, dealing with the environmental impacts. But that doesn't uh, obviate the uh, possible the, the requirement that the states actually approve what their uh, the state commissions approve what they're legally bound and bound to do. But I think there'll be constructive di dialogue on how that all works. So when you go forward, you're not going to have the air regulators are not going to put a element in a plan that they know that the commissions wouldn't improve and vice versa, that the states will be, the commissions will be uh, constructive and, and try and give as much flexibility to the, to the plan writers as possible. Great. Uh, any other questions? Hi, uh, Angela Crooks from the Department of Energy, and I had a question for Nazio. I uh, just wondered if you're looking at distributed generation as part of the overall energy efficiency strategy. 
Yes, we are. Uh, and renewables, certainly, specifically, as well as uh, uh, microgrids, combined heat and power, uh, both. But in the renewable area, we've been working with a number of uh, states and the renewable trade associations to see where that fits in. I think, um, I think some of the challenges in, in that area are extremely dependent upon the state and the region you're in. And a couple of examples about issues we have to work through. In the West, the, a great deal of the renewable resource uh, opportunity sits on federal lands. It has traditionally been very difficult to develop renewables on federal lands, as an example, and there are a number of states that uh, if you look at the calculation of the renewable opportunity contained in the Clean Power Plan draft rule, much of that opportunity sits on federal lands. So I think that's an example of that's a, a huge barrier that has to be worked through as an option. Um, there are also, I think, um, more technical barriers in terms of states that produce a great deal of renewable power um, but perhaps don't consume as much, maybe they export a great deal of it, how does that credit fall? Um, I, the Clean Power Plan draft rule, to my mind, was a little bit unclear on that. I think there are, are issues on both sides. But the short answer is yes, uh, and I think there's a lot to do in that space. And I might mention, and you might want to address this bill, that there are, uh, there's a whole chapter uh, in the menu of options document, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we can talk about distributed generation, and there is a chapter, but I, I wanted to make a broader point, if Absolutely. I can, a couple sure. points. And the common denominator of the two points I want to make um, is there are opportunities um, that this rule presents. There are, there are certainly costs, and it's clear that some of the opposition um, is focused on the cost of implementation. But we should not forget for one second that there are opportunities in this rule for power facilities, for energy companies, for other stakeholders to benefit. And I can only tell you this through anecdote. When we were developing our menu, we must have had 30 meetings with regulated industries. Uh, including renewable industries who wanted to be part of that menu, who wanted to communicate as widely as possible the kinds of things that their products could provide state regulators to uh, be embodied in a plan. Financially and economically, they benefit from states pursuing some of these things. So it's not just um, an adverse impact on economic development in the state, there are efficiencies, there are um, other tremendous opportunities that this program for the smart folks, for the industries that really care, can take advantage of. And we've seen that, and I, I think we're going to see that even more once the final rule is implemented. And then a second quick point, um, I'll tell you a little story about um, something similar to this program. In January of 2011, uh, EPA proposed regulating s states and power facilities and other manufacturing facilities with respect to greenhouse gases, and they required at the time that all major facilities obtain a permit that would require the installation of best available control technology. And at the same time, like today, there were a dozen governors who were suing EPA. And notwithstanding the fact that those governors were suing, and they had you know, legitimate concerns about this, just like today's governors do, the state at the same time was developing the legislative and regulatory infrastructure to comply. So that they were not only playing both sides responsibly, but they were hearing from their industries that they wouldn't be able to expand, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of opportunities in economic development if they didn't have the regulatory infrastructure in place to do so, notwithstanding general opposition to the program. And that was smart of them. And in the end, every state but one actually adopted the program and went ahead because industry was telling them to and complied. And the last state, Texas, eventually came, came along. So there are opportunities if you seek them out in this program to take advantage of a lot of things that can be done. Um, great, thanks very much, Bill. Are there other questions or comments? The one, one, 
issue that I wanted to just raise that builds upon what you were just saying, Bill, is in terms of looking at the different chapters, and I think that there's also one that talks about innovation, and that pursuant to the original enactment of the Clean, um, uh, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments, uh, it struck me that one of the things that we saw there was that there was a lot of innovation, a lot of costs that were much, much lower than what people anticipated, that uh, a lot of things were driven forward that were not necessarily anticipated. So I was just curious whether each of you could comment about that, what your experience is, and what you are seeing, and if there are any particular states or, or other um, industries that you think are are looking at that in particular. Go ahead. Happy to, happy to comment, Carol. I think that's a great question, and it's one, because most of the energy offices uh, uh, report to their governors, they have a particular focus on economic development. So technology innovation generally and in, in supporting businesses' development of those innovations is, is incredibly important. And I think um, we have um, uh, repeatedly been surprised by the kind of innovation that takes place. I think back about the kinds of electricity loads, at least in this space, that we anticipated 10 years ago that haven't materialized. And independent of the financial downturn that we've had, um, you know, loads are, load demand is lower in many places because of that. Everything from the obvious, like LED light bulbs, but also uh, things that, frankly, only a few of us energy nerds know about how building systems work together. I mentioned uh, some of those things in my remarks. And I guess one thing I would add to that, and I think maybe it, it, it emphasizes or builds on what Bill just said with regard to benefits, uh, 39 of the states are um, have formal energy plans that they do in a policy context. We call them comprehensive energy plans. The state energy offices generally lead those. It's being responsive to their governor. Typically when a new governor comes in, sometimes it's legislatively mandated. But they look across the entire energy spectrum, not just electricity, but uh, technologies, companies that are in their states, uh, research capabilities in their states, natural resources. And they try to figure out where they can support particular pathways. And part of that process, much like the, the regulatory framework uh, bill mentioned really helps to drive innovation and, and economic development so there is another side to this that's uh, that is important to look at and I think traditionally as we've seen new rules whether they're environmental rules or state implemented goals or past legislation um, that really does drive innovation it drives the cost down we need to make sure though um, that the regulatory process or uh, or plans such as the clean power plan allow for the kind of flexibility and private investment that's needed to make that happen because that's where it will come from yeah, just to add a few points, uh, you know, the Clean Air Act, probably like other um, important domestic legislation, is a wonderful case study in regulatory development. Uh, when a rule is proposed before it's finally adopted, you know, all interest, most interest groups, um, come up with the worst case scenarios, the highest costs, um, and we could all here write the playbook of, of, of the rhetoric that um, is dispensed once a rule is proposed, and uh, this, it's almost as if the sky is falling. Once the rule is finalized, um, the industries, and this is a huge compliment to them, the industries have immense, an immense amount of talent, and they shift their focus from rhetoric to now they have to comply. And what do they do? They find innovative ways of addressing these national goals that they hadn't particularly shared. I don't want to paint too wide a brush here, but I could. Um, they hadn't shared during the rulemaking process. And I'll give you a couple examples. During the acid rain debate in the um, leading up to the 1990 Clean Air Act, um, the estimates for allowances to reduce sulfur dioxide were 10 times higher than what the actual allowances sold for after implementation. When reformulated gasoline was debated in, in Congress, and Congress eventually adopted uh, a, a law, and uh, EPA eventually adopted regulations, leading up to that, you can look this up, it's, it's public information, there, were, um, there was talk of long lines at gas stations, the cost of gasoline would be you know, between 10 cents and 25 cents higher, and in reality, the cost of reformulated gasoline was a fraction of a penny. It wasn't even noticeable. 
And again, the oil companies learned how to re reduce pollutants in their gasoline when they were required to. So there is a huge opportunity for technical advancement. It may not be shared now, but once the rule is promulgated, um, you can almost guarantee that the impacts and the costs that have been projected will be reduced. And I mean that as a compliment to the industry who has to comply. Yeah, I would just observe there's a lot of innovation going on right now, which is related to, but in some sense separate from what's going on with the Clean Power Plan. Uh, I go to many conferences where utility of the future is debated about we're going to distribute it to a distributed model um, with storage and rooftop solar has become a big issue. I think a lot of the innovation is already underway in some respects. What's happening, for example, up in, with the New York Commission up in uh, Albany is they pr try to prepare for the, for the new business model and prepare the commissions for a new regulatory model. And uh, this is an industry that moves very, has moved very slowly over time. I mean, they make long-term investments for assets and, and infrastructure that's built to be there for a while. And I think that innovation is probably not as fast as maybe in the telephone, as we saw in the telephone uh, side, but uh, uh, clearly it's, it's underway. And I think it will benefit the, 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 com the compliance plan process uh, uh, a great deal. So a lot of that is going to happen even without, without the clean, the power, clean power plan. plan. Okay, uh, could you go, oh, okay, could you just get in line over there? Great, okay. go ahead. Hi, um, another question, um, Angela Crooks, Department of Energy. Um, who is leading the charge right now in terms of starting on the compliance plan work? Is it the air regulators? Is it utilities who want to make sure their interests are protected? Um, who do you see being most mm -hmm. actively involved at this stage? You should probably all answer that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's an excellent question. Um, and uh, I want to just jump out and say the environmental agencies, but I will, I will temper you know, that, that response and say um, we are being deluged in a good way um, with, with requests for meetings, we meaning my members, uh, we request for meetings and discussions with all affected stakeholders. And so while um, the, the environmental agencies, as I mentioned to the gentleman earlier, have the responsibility. Um, stake, affected stakeholders, uh, both government and industry, are not being shy about seeking out meetings and trying to weigh in. So it's, it's a collaborative effort. In some strategies, this will be a utility-only strategy, and the state will have, you know, less responsibility or little responsibility, and it'll be up to the utilities. So the smart utilities are going in and making their case. In other strategies, it will be you know, partly um, state-driven and partly utility-driven, or you know, other common elements, and other uh, stakeholders will be engaged. So I think it's, it's a shared responsibility. Yeah, I, we get, again, you talk about anecdotes. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, anecdotal reports that a lot of states have workshops uh, that they put together with all the regulatory bodies as well as the stakeholders to try and, and f thread their way through this discussion. Um, you know, you also see legislation in some states where the governor is going to have to finally sign off on the on the plan, which is 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 out there as well. So I think it's going to vary from state to state, but um, ultimately, I think just under the, under the Clean Air Act, it's the air regulators that are legally responsible for for submitting the plan. I think uh, basically Chuck's comments exactly right from an energy office perspective. We uh, I think does there's a lot of variation from state to state. Certainly the uh, air agency uh, leadership on the plan development and submission. I think there is. Um, what I would say is surprising is the level of coordination across the three agencies at the state level, and in many states where many of you might be surprised where that's occurring, and I think it's, uh, it's reflective of them being thoughtful and doing the right thing for, uh, for their constituents and, and thinking about the future. So I, 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 don't, uh, I think you can point to particular examples where um, a governor may have charged a particular agency to take the lead in, in some regard, but I think generally it's much more collaborative. And that is actually really, really good news. That's yeah. terrific news. Go ahead. 
Um, thank you. Um, I'm uh, Khalil Shahid with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, and so my question is concerning, so we've been hearing a lot of messages and you know, we can argue about the reliability of the data or the messengers, but that's a completely different argument. But we've, we've been hearing um, a lot of arguments about you know, the threat to the Clean Power Plan on, uh, on, on uh, low income rate payers uh, in, terms of, you know, uh, in terms of rising rates. But then at the same time, when we hear about uh, the compliance options, particularly for energy efficiency, there is always an emphasis on the industrial sector, commercial sectors, and public buildings. And so my question for you all is, you know, through the, is, is through the stakeholder process, you know, what inputs need to be provided in order to ensure that energy efficiency investments actually reach low-income consumers so that these threats about rate hikes, you know, don't actually pan out. I think you all should take a pass at that, too. So uh, who wants to start? I'll start. Okay. okay. So f very good point. And uh, one that um, I know my members are very sensitive uh, with. I'll, I'll make two uh, comments. One is, in our report, um, we don't have a specific chapter on um, environmental justice issues or um, um, uh, the poor or uh, those adversely affected, but there are examples throughout the chapter, whether it's low, um, you know, weatherization programs or, um, or other types of um, energy efficiency programs that will, that will help the poor, that will help those that uh, live in um, uh, impoverished uh, areas. The second point is um, we are involved in discussions with EPA um, on um, assessing environmental justice problems around the country and uh, we've, we've been working with them. There are permitting requirements that affect uh, our business and we are throughout the country um, having to deal with these issues not just in climate uh, strategies but in regular implementation of the Clean Air Act. Uh, so we are, we are sensitive to it, and we're doing our best to try to address these, these issues head on. Well, low, in, low income impacts are a, a major concern among, among the state commissions. Um, and clearly, the, the consumer advocate organizations in the states are, are raising those questions. Um, it's, we, we've supported for years, LIHEAP is, a, is an important way to, to deal with that problem. Uh, Which is the low income. Home low income, right. And uh, actually now, as a, getting back to the innovation question, some of the disruptive technologies that are now being uh, talked about um, actually could result in, in shifting of costs from one customer class to another. So that's something that people are looking at to see that that doesn't happen. And I just would observe uh, the QER that the Department of Energy issued, one of their proposals has to do with a related uh, issue, which is methane emissions. And uh, they would actually provide billions of dollars for um, low income, uh, to, to reimburse low income people who have to pay for, for more uh, expensive uh, pipeline in the ground to keep the emissions down. So I think there's a lot of different pieces to this puzzle, but uh, it's still out there. And David? Sure. T a terrific question. I'm glad you uh, brought it up, actually. We have uh, several things going on in this area uh, through NASIO. I guess first and foremost, I'd say we are developing. I mentioned we have case studies and compliance plan language we're working on. One of those is in the low-income sector for uh, retrofit of low-income homes. And uh, the energy offices, uh, as a group, are always concerned about affordability, but certainly for uh, low-income uh, households in particular. And 26 of the offices run weatherization retrofit programs. Uh, most of that is federally supported. Part of it uh, is uh, uh, utility supported uh, and also private sector uh, engagement as well. So there are hundreds of millions of dollars a year invested in the retrofit side of that for low income households across the country every year that many of the energy offices are engaged in. Those programs are very well monitored, measured, verified. Um, the public dollars are guarded very carefully. The benefits to the, uh, to the resident are multiple, certainly comfort, health, safety, but also because many of their electric bills are supplemented with either federal, state, or private funds, uh, it lowers those costs. So there's a win-win there. So that's another important piece to that. I would also say the, um, there's a, you know, enormous uh, private voluntary efforts that aren't being captured. I 
think of Habitat for Humanity, for example. There's a North Carolina program supported by a state-related entity uh, with Habitat for Humanity that have uh, done over 4,000 new efficient homes, and they've guaranteed the energy bills to be $24 or less per month, heating and cooling. Uh, so the efficiency gains that are there should be rolled up and captured. Hopefully there's a way to monetize that and, uh, and benefit uh, that sector uh, as a part of this so that they uh, don't feel as much of an impact uh, to the degree that rates do increase or bills increase. Yeah, just one quick uh, follow-up. First, you know, as it relates to whether it's LIHEAP or other federal or state subsidies, we know that those subsidies are being reduced. Um, you know, and so, and, and when it comes to low-income weatherization, in most cases, whether it's through the utility or through some other program, you know, those programs are, are typically limited to direct installs. They'll change a light bulb, they'll change a refrigerator, but they don't really get into, you know, much more deeper retrofits, particularly for low-income multifamily properties. Um, and, and, and so, you know, my question is, and again, to toss it back to you all, because I don't want to come away with the assumption that enough is being done. And so, uh, and so my question again is, how do we ensure that, you know, a greater proportion of investment from, you know, that, that, is, that is generated, that is incentivized from the, from the Clean Power Plan actu actually reach these sectors so that, you know, a state doesn't, in its in its, uh, in its plan for compliance doesn't say, well, we can reach our energy efficiency target through putting everything in industrial or commercial and we don't need to address this sector. So we want to make sure, how can we make sure that these communities are actually at the table, that they're actually included in the, in the, com in the uh, compliance plan to a rate that's actually, you know, fair? Well, that's a slightly different question, and I, would, and I think that you're correct. We have to make sure that they're at the table. I would say, just back to your point about uh, there are simply replacement programs. In the single-family residential area, that's certainly not correct. Um, in multifamily utility-oriented programs, that may be very true. Uh, so I think that that certainly needs to be addressed. But within weatherization, as we think of it, for typically either very small multifamily or single-family residential, it is much more comprehensive up to the point that the law allows. So there are very strict cost-effectiveness guidelines around it. But I do think... Um, certainly looking again not only to environmental justice issues but also least cost the opportunities in multifamily are enormous and I think just from a low-hanging fruit if you will perspective even um, that's an important important one that we've been working I know your organization has as well uh, we have a group at NASIO that's been focused on this for the last year and a half and I think it's a, I think it's one we need to, to tune up and elevate and just a quick point uh, affected affected constituencies, whether they are regulated or low income or others, are invited to the table. And we have, at the state and local level, a public hearing. Well, we, they're invited to the table because if you want to weigh in with a state or local official, you know, knock on the door, or call ahead, or send an email and set up a meeting. And um, they take meetings. And secondly, um, these processes, when they get more formal and they get to the proposal, stage at the state level, um, as you know, there are public hearings and there are opportunities to share this information. But your point is well taken and, um, you know, we will continuously try to do better. Okay. And I must say, uh, I think based upon everything that we heard here too, that uh, an important thing to remember is that there's all, there, that most states also have state consumer utility advocates. It is very, very important, I think, to make sure that all of these people are truly engaged and and understand these really important issues that are being raised, um, because that is a terribly important issue. And I would just also quickly mention that uh, another um, uh, approach that is being used um, by a number of different kinds of utilities, including rural co-ops and municipal utilities, as well as some investor-owned utilities, is a whole approach called on-bill financing for energy efficiency retrofits, which is a way to provide a much greater expansion, potentially, than what we are able to achieve through the low-income weatherization program. Um, and that can really bring real savings and multiple benefits to um, to homes, to residential um, dwellings across the country. Uh, any last questions or comments? Oh, okay. Um, two more? Sure. Uh, hi, Matt Connolly with the Center for Climate and Security. I know you all focus on state level issues, maybe more than what's happening on the Hill here, but I just want to get your perspective on if there are any 
proposals in the House or the Senate that you're looking at that could be complementary to the Clean Power Plan. Obviously, there's an effort to allow states to opt out of it, but both the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee are trying to put together comprehensive energy bills uh, to try to enact something in this Congress. Are there anything, any specific proposals that you're all looking at, whether it's on the energy efficiency side or natural gas permitting or PERPA or any potentially complementary policies that would help the Clean Power Plan be successful? Thanks for your question. Go ahead, David. Uh, sure. There are, <coughs> excuse me, we are very engaged on uh, uh, the process going on uh, in Congress in that area from the energy perspective, among the efficiency bills in particular, but all the energy bills. Uh, I think there are some 70 now uh, underway, at least on the Senate side. A number of those, I think, would complement uh, the Clean Power Plan in the, in the sense that they promote efficiency. Most of those are bipartisan in nature. Um, uh, there's the SAVE Act and a number of other bills that I think produce efficiency benefits. They're not intended for, the, for, for compliance with the Clean Power Plan, but they certainly produce some benefits. The one thing I would point to, though, that uh, we've been very interested in, it's actually one of the few energy bills that have passed and been signed into law uh, this year, and that's Tenet Star, uh, something that NASIO and the Energy Office supported. It's a voluntary recognition program for leasehold energy efficiency improvements. So, for example, if you're leasing office space, a uh, recognition program uh, put forward in part by the commercial real estate industry, which I think has great promise, again, promoting private sector investment. So those are the kinds of things that we see among those bills that I think uh, would be helpful. There are also some financing measures that I think are important uh, that uh, contribute to that, much as Carol just suggested. I agree with what David said, and I'll repeat what I said earlier, that um, one of the most important legislative actions that could be taken over the next couple of months is to provide funding under the, in the appropriations bill under EPA's budget uh, to help states fund the Clean Power Plan. And the administration has recommended uh, $25 million for assistance for the Clean Power Plan and a $15 million increase for other air pollution programs. And what we have said to make it easier to support is you don't need to earmark $25 million for the Clean Power Plan, but lump the money together, the $40 million increase, provide it to the states, make them accountable for how, for how they spend it, and for those that can spend it on climate, let them do so, and for others that don't want to, they have a great use for it for other clean air programs. That would be very important. Just very quickly, um, we've been looking at some of the, the PURPA amendment uh, legislation that's been offered by, and I think in both both houses, and uh, some of that is consistent with what state commissions are already doing. I'm talking about, this is a different 111D. It's 111D in, the, in PURPA. It talks about different policies that the states are, are asked to develop or consider, and some of those look, would be beneficial, I think, to the Clean Power Plan. Next question. Thank you. Hi, Stacy Wiesbach with Renew and Sustain Consulting. Our question is going back to reliability, affordability, sustainability. Is the CPP going to support eco districts, microgrids, net zero projects, and all associated innovative renewables energy strategies? <laughs> this is where I need my chauffeur. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> That's, so I, help me understand your question a little better. Could you go to the microphone again? So we were curious if it's going to allow for that kind of support. Well, so that, that, that's actually a good question to make a broader point. If any of you and your, your com colleagues, uh, constituents, um, the public uh, has any viable you know, compliance option that they think could help a state or local agency, everything is on the table. And that was a point I was making earlier that we are not constrained by how EPA set the targets for each state. The states press a reset button and they're on their own and coming up with the array of measures 
that could be included. And if you think yours is a viable one, then the responsibility is to um, talk to the states as best you can, share that information, and maybe we can follow up afterwards and let them decide on their own with your input as to whether or not it makes sense. Did you want to add anything? I, I think that it's really important that um, not to assume that everybody knows about every possible compliance strategy or technology or a particular approach that may work. And it strikes me that, that we are looking at a challenge that is very different with regard to the proposed regulation um, that all of our speakers have, have talked about in that it really does provide for much more in the way of options, great flexibility in terms of how the uh, uh, plans are put together in terms of the array of options that can be uh, assembled across sectors, et cetera, and put together. Uh, but it really is incumbent upon, I guess, everybody to make sure that as many options as possible are really brought forward to those who are going to be held responsible for making those final decisions. And we should not assume that everybody is going to know what all of those possible ideas might be and how they could work. And so, on that note, I want to thank all of our speakers. I th hope that this was helpful to you. Uh, and please make sure to look at that menu of options, and at least at the summary that was outside. The whole report. And, and please, at the whole report, because it'll make Bill feel so much better if you really go through that f over 400 pages so that they can feel really good that their, th that their work is being taken seriously. And I hope that you leave this forum with a better understanding of why I actually think this is a very exciting time in that we are really seeing kind of the coming together of of officials at the state and local level who are really working together to understand each other's perspectives, responsibilities, and how best to solve problems that are really going to make sense for their states. So join me in thanking our wonderful panel. <laughs>